Welcome back. Today I'm going to be looking at the digital position control of a DC motor. Uh, the old fashioned word for that is a servo. It's uh, serving you in other words. I think it's from a Greek word. And uh, when you think of a servo most people think of the sort of things you get in model aircraft or model robotics. These uh, small or sometimes quite a bit bigger devices that you buy which work off pulse width modulation. I've got one here for example which I can hold up and there it is. It's quite a beefy one and it's got uh, three terminals and you can connect that to a micro or special chip and get the shaft to rotate by a certain angle clockwise or anti-clockwise. But I'm not going to be looking at this particular one uh, instead I've got uh, a little bit more fundamental uh, information here. I'm going to be building my own one uh, and going to have a look and see um, how you get various components and how they fit together. Before I do that I'm going to um, look at the analog servo and how it worked uh, before I go to the digital thing because I think it's a little bit easier to see how the analog one works. And the analog servo uses a potentiometer. Here's a potentiometer here, and it's got three terminals. The control there, clockwise, anti-clockwise, and uh, you can connect a power supply across there. Let's say plus V, minus V, and pick off the center, and you get a voltage proportional to the uh, angle that you rotate the shaft at. Now. If you connect the this, if you manage to connect it to a shaft of a motor, as the motor the motor rotor turns, then the potentiometer turns with it, and therefore we can uh, design a system such that uh, we can measure the angle of the rotation. So this is the. Uh, potentiometer but the problem with the potentiometer is it's got a limit as to how far it can go it's got an end stop so it can't go 360 uh, even if you took that end stop out which is in some cases possible you've got an area which has got no uh, you've got no control over it a sort of blank area uh, and uh, that would also give you problems so therefore we look for other methods when we do uh, digital control systems to give us a sensor the other thing is it's got well, although this one is a very cheap one, you can get expensive ones that have got very little um, friction. Uh, but nevertheless, um, they've got a, a wiper on them which makes contact with a resistor, uh, which in theory can wear out. And here's how you'd use it. Uh, you've got your potentiometer over here as the set point for your servo. And you've got some kind of difference amplifier here, and a controller, let's say here, or a power amplifier actually, power amplifier and controller. Sometimes the controller is part of the error in here. Drives the motor, which drives in this case in 10 I, but it drives a mass, and that drives another potentiometer on the shaft. And by linking these two together electrically we can derive an error and so that when the shaft is rotated by a desired angle, let's say 45 degrees, the error goes to zero and the motor stops turning. Likewise if you move rapidly this potentiometer it will move back and forward hopefully and track it. Of course uh, it may not track it perfectly and that's part of the Feel like the science behind control systems is how do we design a controller to do this so that the output tracks the input as closely as possible, as fast as possible, and if the, in, everything anything tries to stop it turning uh, in terms of disturbance, sense of wind or friction or whatever, then uh, it, it, it rejects these disturbances. And you may or may not have looked at mathematical models using Laplace transforms, as you do for analog systems. Uh, you can model the motor on the load for example, the uh, motor drive which is the amplifier, 
and the amplifier is a DC amplifier. Uh, the DC amplifier uh, has a standing current in it, so it can kind of get a bit on the hot side, but nevertheless these systems were used and used relatively successfully, uh, but they're a little bit dated now uh, with the new methods. You can also measure speed if you use a small DC motor. And, uh, If you haven't actually got a small DC motor, well, it's one here, but something like this, if you were to attach that to the end of the shaft of the motor, then uh, you, it acts as a generator, and you get a voltage out, which is proportional to speed, and then you can measure um, angular velocity. But when you're doing that, you're measuring the... Um, you, you, you've got a speed control system, and not a position control system. Now, uh, you can use a, a speed sensor and a position sensor. That has certain advantages, uh, but I won't be going into that in this talk. Here's the speed control. Again, the potentiometer up here. An error amplifier. Uh, there should really be a power amplifier here as well. It's all combined and uh, driving a mass and it goes rotates at a particular speed. And as before, you can get a mathematical model. This is a first order transfer function, set point, and so on. And back to the position control system, this is what it might be used. In one degree of freedom, you're just rotating a, an antennae system where you're looking, for, looking at Mars or trying to receive uh, signals from space. You've got a potentiometer here, which you turn say I want it to go a particular angle, goes into the difference amplifier and, and uh, controller. There's always a gearbox. Um, in my particular system it doesn't have a gearbox but that's just for a little bit of convenience. The gearbox gives you more torque at the cost of lower speed. Um, that's, it's normal to have a gearbox uh, and that will rotate the antenna and you've got a second potentiometer here so you need the, the same one here. Here's a mathematical model uh, with the input, uh, in this case azimuth, from the potentiometer and the output is connected to the antennae and with another potentiometer and it goes into an error of course through an amplifier, it there would be a controller here as well something like a PID controller into the motor, this is a armature controlled motor, a fixed field uh, the example I've got is quite a small small motor and it's relatively big but it's not enormous like a motor for a, driving a, a, an antenna that uh, for looking at the galaxy so mine is a small 300 watt uh, bicycle motor and then it drives the load and so on. Now, Quadriger encoder is the digital version of the potentiometer. The Quadriger encoder gives us, uh, is, gives us two outputs, A and B. There, there actually is a third one which I'm not using here. And um, here's a real one here. It's the same as the one in the picture. It needs a power supply as well, like the old-fashioned potentiometer. The thing about the um, this uh, quadriger encoder is it goes round forever. It's uh, it's got no beginning and no end, so it's got no end stops, unlike this, which goes stops. Now you get two outputs A and B, and if it's going in one direction, these uh, pulses uh, one leads the other. The A, let's say, leads the B, and it's going in reverse. You get the other way around. You get B leads A. Uh, the more pulses you get in a given time will determine the speed if you wanted to measure speed. If you want to measure position, you just need to count these pulses so you know whether it's going positive or it's going negative in the other, clockwise or anti-clockwise, by simple logic. Uh, I'm going to show you the thing actually working. So here's an oscilloscope over here. Oops, and on the oscilloscope, I'm 
might just show the there's the pulses, I'm just turning it around. Oops, let's just get it triggered, there we go. So there we see blue is ahead of yellow. Go the other direction. And there, there it is. And if I do it really fast I get more pulses. So do it a bit slowly, there we go. The, I'm afraid the triggering isn't brilliant. But that's the chord encoder. And there's a number of ways that you can read these in a micro. The common way is to use interrupts. Uh, and there's a stack of information on the internet if you want to do that. Well, I thought it would be a good idea to, if you like, copy the analog control system and digitize the whole thing, make a digital equivalent. Uh, how do we do that? We go back to the slides. Well, instead of the amplifier, we're going to use uh, an H bridge instead of a DC amplifier. And the H bridge is basically just uh, switching two transistors. So if you wanted to go in clockwise direction, there's a motor in the middle here. You switch that guy and you switch that guy and these two are off that one's on that one's on those two are off goes clockwise let's say you want to go anti-clockwise this one's on that one's on and those two are off so a simple switching selection of the two of the transistors the MOSFETs normally MOSFETs have got a very small on resistance and therefore uh, the heat generated, uh, unless you get to really high currents is, uh, is quite small you can get a very small looking device and here's the block diagram. I'll zoom out a little bit so we can see it. Uh, so we've got a, a quad encoder here for the set point. We've got our, a micro or microcontroller of some sort. It, in my case I've got a, a MyRio which runs on LabVIEW and it's got an FPGA but you could use an Arduino or any form of micro. And you've got the two outputs A and B and you decode them to determine whether it's going clockwise or whether it's going anti-clockwise and you count the pulses and you can determine how far around you've travelled in the shaft. At the output of the shaft there's a feedback of another uh, identical uh, uh, quad detector, quad encoder and it goes in as well so you need four. The output of that is pulse width modulation out of the micro, micros I've got PWM outputs normally, it goes into an H bridge and that drives the motor. There's also a forward and reverse logic switch in most of these, not all of them, there's another, you can use other methods, but forward and reverse just selects those two transistors I mentioned earlier. And then for pulse width modulation, if you're using 25% duty cycle here on the top, and you can see that the DC level is going to be quite small. 50% the DC level will be maybe halfway through this and 75% it will be nearer, in this case 5 volts. In my case it's um, going to be 12 volts. Mine runs on 12 volts. It's quite a beefy motor mine. So you can find the average value of this mathematically. It's just the ratio of the this width here to the width here, like tau over t. Uh, now once you've driven, you've got the motor running, it connects to the load, this goes to another identical uh, quad detector and then you get your feedback. Now let's look at the real thing over here. And uh, here's my motor. It's, a, as I say, quite a big motor. I think it's uh, 300 watts. It's not really intended to be used as a servo, but I'm doing it anyway because it's what I had lying around. Uh, and there's a mass which is here, or rotating. That's your antenna, if you like, or whatever you want to call it. There's no gearbox. You notice there's a coupling here, which couples onto a quad detector. 
and I've got a second quad detector, a quad detector here for the set point. I've got a micro which is here, it's in my wheel, and an H bridge which is here. It's quite a cheap H bridge but it takes a fair old whack of current. I'm going to turn the set point and you can see as I turn the set point the output tracks it rather well and back and forward. If I go I can go right past 360 which I couldn't do with a potentiometer. And as many times as I like. If you like the science or the engineering of control systems is designing such a system, how do I get a quick response? So as I desire, let's say 90 degrees, how can I get there without it overshooting or oscillating? As it tends to do if you don't do it properly. It's pretty well designed as you can see. So if I go to the program, uh, but now looking at the uh, user interface, which uh, you can use with the My Rio, that's one of the beautiful beauties of the My Rio. Uh, if we go over here to the PC, I can uh, put a square wave. Well, actually, first of all, I'll just manually change, and you see that I can looking at the angular position there as it changes. Now, if I put in a square wave. There we go, tracking back and forward. You see there's a tiny bit of overshoot, but not much, and we'll go back to the where it is. To increase the frequency of course. things about using a quad detector unlike a potentiometer. In a potentiometer there's a natural uh, midpoint when you connect plus and minus V or zero to V. Halfway across the voltage range is the center point uh, at zero volts let's say or V upon two and that's kind of um, fits in with hardware but when you've got one of these there is no beginning and there's no end. It goes round indefinitely. Because of that, you need to tell it what the zero point is when you turn it on. So I can do that with this uh, switch here. So if I turn this round so that it's sort of offset, I can then click this and it centre zeroes it. And uh, any digital control system has to you know, like um, know where it is when you switch it on. So you have to put it in a known position a, a sort of setup uh, which which is automatic when you start up whereas an analog one knows already because the voltage is uh, fixed with a potentiometer so there's the type that you sort of compact servos that you can buy off the shelf they use um, sort of 50 hertz pulse width modulation a special width uh, of the pulse that you put in from a micro uh, and there's a big monster here, the home built one. Effectively the same except for there's no gearbox. Okay, that's it.